Chapter 8 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe Raven Edition, Volume 2 by Edgar Allan Poe This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison The Fall of the House of Usher Sans court et en lutte suspendue, sitôt qu'on le touche, il raison. De Beranger. During the whole of a dull, dark, and soundless day in the autumn of the year, when the clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens, I had been passing alone on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of country and at length found myself as the shades of the evening drew on within view of the melancholy house of usher i know not how it was but with the first glimpse of the building a sense of insufferable gloom pervaded my spirit i say insufferable for the feeling was unrelieved by any of that half pleasurable because poetic sentiment with which the mind usually receives even the sternest natural images of the desolate or terrible i looked upon the scene before me upon the mere house and the simple landscape features of the domain upon the bleak walls upon the vacant eye-like windows upon a few rank sedges and upon a few white trunks of decayed trees with an utter depression of soul which i can compare to no earthly sensation more properly than to the after-dream of the reveller upon opium the bitter lapse into everyday life the hideous dropping off of the veil there was an iciness a sinking a sickening of the heart an unredeemed dreariness of thought which no goading of the imagination could torture into aught of the sublime what was it i paused to think what was it that so unnerved me in the contemplation of the house of usher it was a mystery all insoluble nor could i grapple with the shadowy fancies that crowded upon me as i pondered i was forced to fall back upon the unsatisfactory conclusion that while beyond doubt there are combinations of very simple natural objects which have the power of thus affecting us still the analysis of this power lies among considerations beyond our depth it was possible i reflected that a mere different arrangement of the particulars of the scene of the details of the picture would be sufficient to modify or perhaps to annihilate its capacity for sorrowful impression and acting upon this idea i reined my horse to the precipitous brink of a black and lurid tarn that lay in unruffled lustre by the dwelling and gazed down but with a shudder even more thrilling than before upon the remodelled and inverted images of the grey sedge 
and the ghastly tree stems and the vacant and eye-like windows nevertheless in this mansion of gloom i now propose to myself a sojourn of some weeks its proprietor roderick usher had been one of my boon companions in boyhood but many years had elapsed since our last meeting a letter however had lately reached me in a distant part of the country a letter from him which in its wildly importunate nature had admitted of no other than a personal reply the m s gave evidence of nervous agitation the writer spoke of acute bodily illness of a mental disorder which oppressed him and of an earnest desire to see me as his best and indeed his only personal friend with a view of attempting by the cheerfulness of my society some alleviation of his malady it was the manner in which all this and much more was said it was the apparent heart that went with his request which allowed me no room for hesitation and i accordingly obeyed forthwith what i still considered a very singular summons although as boys we had been even intimate associates yet i really knew little of my friend his reserve had been always excessive and habitual i was aware however that his very ancient family had been noted time out of mind for a peculiar sensibility of temperament displaying itself through long ages in many works of exalted art and manifested of late in repeated deeds of munificent yet unobtrusive charity as well as in a passionate devotion to the intricacies perhaps even more than to the orthodox and easily recognizable beauties of musical science i had learned too the very remarkable fact that the stem of the usher race all time honoured as it was had put forth at no period any enduring branch in other words that the entire family lay in the direct line of descent and had always with very trifling and very temporary variation so lain it was this deficiency i considered while running over in thought the perfect keeping of the character of the premises with the accredited character of the people and while speculating upon the possible influence which the one in the long lapse of centuries might have exercised upon the other it was this deficiency perhaps of collateral issue and the consequent undeviating transmission from sire to son of the patrimony with the name which had at length so identified the two as to merge the original title of the estate in the quaint and equivocal appellation of the house of usher an appellation which seemed to include in the minds of the peasantry who used it both the family and the family mansion i have said that the sole effect of my somewhat childish experiment that of looking down within the town had been to deepen the first singular impression 
there can be no doubt that the consciousness of the rapid increase of my superstition for why should i not so term it served mainly to accelerate the increase itself such i have long known is the paradoxical law of all sentiments having terror as a basis and it might have been for this reason only that when i again uplifted my eyes to the house itself from its image in the pool there grew in my mind a strange fancy a fancy so ridiculous indeed that i but mention it to show the vivid force of the sensation which oppressed me i had so worked upon my imagination as really to believe that about the whole mansion and domain there hung an atmosphere peculiar to themselves and their immediate vicinity an atmosphere which had no affinity with the air of heaven but which had reeked up from the decayed trees and the grey wall and the silent tarn a pestilent and mystic vapour dull sluggish faintly discernible and leaden-hued shaking off from my spirit what must have been a dream i scanned more narrowly the real aspect of the building its principal feature seemed to be that of an excessive antiquity the discoloration of ages had been great minute fungi overspread the whole exterior hanging in a fine tangled webwork from the eaves yet all this was apart from any extraordinary dilapidation no portion of the masonry had fallen and there appeared to be a wild inconsistency between its still perfect adaptation of parts and the crumbling condition of the individual stones in this there was much that reminded me of the specious totality of old woodwork which has rotted for long years in some neglected vault with no disturbance from the breath of the external air beyond this indication of extensive decay however the fabric gave little token of instability perhaps the eye of a scrutinizing observer might have discovered a barely perceptible fissure which extending from the roof of the building in front made its way down the wall in a zigzag direction until it became lost in the sullen waters of the tarn noticing these things i rode over a short causeway to the house a servant in waiting took my horse and i entered the gothic archway of the hall a valet of stealthy step thence conducted me in silence through many dark and intricate passages in my progress to the studio of his master much that i encountered on the way contributed i know not how to heighten the vague sentiments of which i have already spoken while the objects around me while the carvings of the ceilings the sombre tapestries of the walls the ebon blackness of the floors and the phantasmagoric armorial trophies which rattled as i strode were but matters to which or to such as which i had been accustomed from my infancy while i hesitated not to acknowledge how familiar was all this i still wondered to find how unfamiliar were the fancies which ordinary images were stirring up on one of the staircases i met the physician of the family his countenance i thought wore a mingled expression of low cunning and perplexity he accosted me with trepidation and passed on 
the valet now threw open a door and ushered me into the presence of his master the room in which i found myself was very large and lofty the windows were long narrow and pointed and at so vast a distance from the black oaken floor as to be altogether inaccessible from within feeble gleams of encrimsoned light made their way through the trellised panes and served to render sufficiently distinct the more prominent objects around the eye however struggled in vain to reach the remoter angles of the chamber or the recesses of the vaulted and fretted ceiling dark draperies hung upon the walls the general furniture was profuse comfortless antique and tattered many books and musical instruments lay scattered about but failed to give any vitality to the scene i felt that i breathed an atmosphere of sorrow an air of stern deep and irredeemable gloom hung over and pervaded all upon my entrance usher arose from a sofa on which he had been lying at full length and greeted me with a vivacious warmth which had much in it i at first thought of an overdone cordiality of the constrained effort of the ennui man of the world a glance however at his countenance convinced me of his perfect sincerity we sat down and for some moments while he spoke not i gazed upon him with a feeling half of pity half of awe surely man had never before so terribly altered in so brief a period as had roderick usher it was with difficulty that i could bring myself to admit the identity of the one being before me with the companion of my early boyhood yet the character of his face had been at all times remarkable a cadaverousness of complexion an eye large liquid and luminous beyond comparison lips somewhat thin and very pallid but of a surpassingly beautiful curve a nose of a delicate hebrew model but with a breadth of nostril unusual in similar formations a finely moulded chin speaking in its want of prominence of a want of moral energy hair of a more than web-like softness and tenuity these features with an inordinate expansion above the regions of the temple made up altogether a countenance not easily to be forgotten and now in the mere exaggeration of the prevailing character of these features and of the expression they were wont to convey lay so much of change that i doubted to whom i spoke the now ghastly pallor of the skin and the now miraculous lustre of the eye above all things startled and even awed me the silken hair too had been suffered to grow all unheeded and as in its wild gossamer texture it floated rather than fell about the face i could not even with effort connect its arabesque expression with any idea of simple humanity in the manner of my friend i was at once struck with an incoherence an inconsistency and i soon found this to arise from a series of feeble and futile struggles to overcome an habitual trepidancy an excessive nervous agitation for something of this nature i had indeed been prepared no less by his letter than by reminiscences of certain boyish traits and by conclusions 
deduced from his peculiar physical conformation and temperament. His action was alternately vivacious and sullen. His voice varied rapidly from a tremulous indecision when the animal spirits seemed utterly in abeyance to that species of energetic concision that abrupt weighty unhurried and hollow sounding enunciation that leaden self-balanced and perfectly modulated guttural utterance which may be observed in the lost drunkard or the irreclaimable eater of opium during the periods of his most intense excitement it was thus that he spoke of the object of my visit of his earnest desire to see me and of the solace he expected me to afford him he entered at some length into what he conceived to be the nature of his malady it was he said a constitutional and a family evil and one for which he despaired to find a remedy a mere nervous affection he immediately added which would undoubtedly soon pass off it displayed itself in a host of unnatural sensations some of these as he detailed them interested and bewildered me although perhaps the terms and the general manner of the narration had their weight he suffered much from a morbid acuteness of the senses the most insipid food was alone endurable he could wear only garments of certain texture the odours of all flowers were oppressive his eyes were tortured by even a faint light and there were but peculiar sounds and these from stringed instruments which did not inspire him with horror to an anomalous species of terror i found him a bounden slave i shall perish said he i must perish in this deplorable folly thus thus and not otherwise shall i be lost i dread the events of the future not in themselves but in their results i shudder at the thought of any even the most trivial incident which may operate upon this intolerable agitation of soul i have indeed no abhorrence of danger except in its absolute effect in terror in this unnerved in this pitiable condition i feel that the period will sooner or later arrive when i must abandon life and reason together in some struggle with the grim phantasm fear i learned moreover at intervals and through broken and equivocal hints another singular feature of his mental condition he was enchained by certain superstitious impressions in regard to the dwelling which he tenanted and whence for many years he had never ventured forth in regard to an influence whose supposititious force was conveyed in terms too shadowy here to be restated an influence which some peculiarities in the mere form and substance of his family mansion had by dint of long sufferance he said obtained over his spirit an effect which the physique of the grey walls and turrets and of the dim tarn into which they all looked down had at length brought about upon the morale of his existence he admitted however although with hesitation that much of the peculiar gloom which thus afflicted him could be traced to a more natural and far more palpable origin to the severe and long-continued illness indeed to the evidently approaching dissolution of a tenderly beloved sister his sole companion for long years his last and only relative on earth her decease he said with a bitterness which i can never forget would leave him him the hopeless and the frail the last of the ancient race of the ashes while he spoke the lady madeline 
for so was she called, passed slowly through a remote portion of the apartment, and without having noticed my presence, disappeared. I regarded her with an utter astonishment, not unmingled with dread, and yet I found it impossible to account for such feelings. A sensation of stupor oppressed me as my eyes followed her retreating steps. When a door at length closed upon her, my glance sought instinctively and eagerly the countenance of the brother, but he had buried his face in his hands, and I could only perceive that a far more than ordinary oneness had overspread the emaciated fingers through which trickled many passionate tears. The disease of the Lady Madeline had long baffled the skill of her physicians. A settled apathy, a gradual wasting away of the person, and frequent, although transient affections, of a partially cataleptical character, were the unusual diagnosis. Hitherto she had steadily borne up against the pressure of her malady, and had not betaken herself finally to bed, but on the closing in of the evening of my arrival at the house, she succumbed, as her brother told me at night, with inexpressible agitation, to the prostrating power of the destroyer, and I learned that the glimpse I had obtained of her person would thus probably be the last I should obtain, that the lady, at least while living, will be seen by me no more. For several days ensuing, her name was unmentioned by either Usher or myself, and during this period I was busied in earnest endeavours to alleviate the melancholy of my friend. We painted and read together, or I listened, as if in a dream, to the wild improvisations of his speaking guitar, and thus, as a closer and still closer intimacy, admitted me more unreservedly into the recesses of his spirit, the more bitterly did I perceive the futility of all attempt at cheering a mind from which darkness, as if an inherent positive quality, poured forth upon all objects of the moral and physical universe in one unceasing radiation of gloom. I shall ever bear about me a memory of the many solemn hours I thus spent alone with the master of the house of Usher, yet I should fail in any attempt to convey an idea of the exact character of the studies, or of the occupations, in which he involved me, or led me the way. An excited and highly distempered ideality threw a sulphurious lustre over all, his long improvised dirges will ring for ever in my ears. Among other things, I hold painfully in mind a certain singular perversion and amplification of the wild air of the last waltz of Van Weber. From the paintings over which his elaborate fancy brooded, and which grew touch by touch, into vaguenesses at which I shuddered the more thrillingly, because I shuddered knowing not why. From these paintings, vivid as their images now are before me, I would in vain endeavour to adduce more than a small portion which should lie within the compass of merely written words. By the utter simplicity, by the nakedness of his designs, he arrested and overawed attention, if ever mortal painted an idea, that mortal was Roderick Usher, for me at least, in the circumstances then surrounding me, there arose, out of the pure abstractions which the hypochondriac contrived to throw upon his canvas, an intensity of intolerable awe, no shadow of which felt I ever yet, in the contemplation of the certainly glowing yet too concrete reveries of Fuseli. 
one of the phantasmagoric conceptions of my friend, partaking not so rigidly of the spirit of abstraction, may be shadowed forth, although feebly, in words. A small picture presented the interior of an immensely long and rectangular vault or tunnel, with low walls, smooth, white, and without interruption or device. Certain accessory points of the design served well to convey the idea that this excavation lay at an exceeding depth below the surface of the earth. No outlet was observed in any portion of its vast extent, and no torch or other artificial source of light was discernible. Yet a flood of intense rays rolled throughout, and bathed the whole in a ghastly and inappropriate splendour. I have just spoken of that morbid condition of the auditory nerve, which rendered all music intolerable to the sufferer, with the exception of certain effects of stringed instruments. It was, perhaps, the narrow limits to which he thus confined himself upon the guitar, which gave birth in great measure to the fantastic character of his performances but the fervid facility of his impromptus could not be so accounted for they must have been and were in the notes as well as in the words of his wild fantasies for he not unfrequently accompanied himself with rhymed verbal improvisations the result of that intense mental collectedness and concentration to which i have previously alluded as observable only in particular moments of the highest artificial excitement the words of one of these rhapsodies i have easily remembered i was perhaps the more forcibly impressed with it as he gave it because in the under or mystic current of its meaning i fancied that i perceived and for the first time a full consciousness on the part of Usher, of the tottering of his lofty reason upon her throne. The verses, which were entitled The Haunted Palace, ran very nearly, if not accurately, thus. 1. In the greenest of our valleys by good angels tenanted, once a fair and stately palace, radiant palace, reared its head, in the monarch thought's dominion it stood there never seraph spread a pinion over fabric half so fair two banners yellow glorious golden on its roof did float and flow this all this was in the olden time long ago and every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day Along the ramparts plumed and pallid, a winged odour went away. 3. Wanderers in that happy valley, through two luminous windows, saw spirits moving musically to a lute's well-tuned law, round about a throne where sitting poor Ferrogene in state his glory well befitting, the ruler of the realm was seen. For, and all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door, through which came flowing, 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 and sparkling evermore, a troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing in voices of surpassing beauty the wit and wisdom of their king five but evil things in robes of sorrow assailed the monarch's highest date ah let us mourn for never morrow shall dawn upon him desolate 
and round about his home the glory that blushed and bloomed is but a dim remembered story of the old time entombed six and travellers now within that valley through the red litten window see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody while like a rapid gaspy river through the pale door a hideous throng rush out for ever and laugh but smile no more i well remember that suggestions arising from this ballad led us into a train of thought wherein there became manifest an opinion of usher's which i mention not so much on account of its novelty for other men watson dr percival spallanzani and especially the bishop of lander see chemical essays volume five have thought thus as on account of the pertinacity with which he maintained it this opinion in its general form was that of the sentience of all vegetable things but in his disordered fancy the idea had assumed a more daring character and trespassed under certain conditions upon the kingdom of inorganization i lack words to express the full extent or the earnest abandon of his persuasion the belief however was connected as i have previously hinted with the grey stones of the home of his forefathers the conditions of the sentience had been here he imagined fulfilled in the method of collocation of these stones in the order of their arrangement as well as in that of the many fungi which overspread them and of the decayed trees which stood around above all in the long undisturbed endurance of this arrangement and in its reduplication in the still waters of the tarn its evidence the evidence of the sentience was to be seen he said and i here started as he spoke in the gradual yet certain condensation of an atmosphere of their own about the waters and the walls the result was discoverable he added in that silent yet importunate and terrible influence which for centuries had moulded the destinies of his family and which made him what i now saw him what he was such opinions need no comment and i will make none our books the books which for years had formed no small portion of the mental existence of the invalid were as might be supposed in strict keeping with this character of phantasm we pored together over such works as the ververt et chartreuse of grasset the belle of machiavelli the heaven and hell of swedenborg the subterranean voyage of nicholas klim by holberg the chiromancy of robert blood of jean dan d'agine and of de la chambre the journey into the blue distance of Tiet, and the city of the sun of campanella one favourite volume was a small octavo edition of the directorium inquisitorium by the dominican emeric de giron and there were passages in pomponius mela about the old african satyrs and egipans over which usher would sit dreaming for hours his chief delight however was found in the perusal of an exceedingly rare and curious book in quarto gothic the manual of a forgotten church the vigiliae mortuorum secundum corum ecclesiae majuntinae i could not help thinking 
of the wild ritual of this work, and of its probable influence upon the hypochondriac, when, one evening, having informed me abruptly that the Lady Madeline was no more, he stated his intention of preserving her corpse for a fortnight, previously to its final interment, in one of the numerous vaults within the main walls of the building. The worldly reason, however, a sign for this singular proceeding, was one which I did not feel at liberty to dispute. The brother had been led to his resolution, so he told me, by consideration of the unusual character of the malady of the deceased, of certain obtrusive and eager inquiries on the part of her medical men, and of the remote and exposed situation of the burial ground of the family. I will not deny that when I call to mind the sinister countenance of the person whom I met upon the staircase on the day of my arrival at the house, I had no desire to oppose what I regarded as, at best, but a harmless and by no means an unnatural precaution. At the request of Usher, I personally aided him in the arrangements for the temporary entombment. The body having been encoffined, we two alone bore it to its rest. The vault in which we placed it, and which had been so long unopened that our torches, half smothered in its oppressive atmosphere, gave us little opportunity for investigation, was small, damp, and entirely without means of admission for light, lying at great depth immediately beneath that portion of the building in which was my own sleeping apartment. It had been used, apparently, in remote feudal times for the worst purposes of a donjon keep, and, in later days, as a place of deposit for powder or some other highly combustible substance, as a portion of its floor and the whole interior of a long archway through which we reached it, were carefully sheathed with copper. The door of massive iron had been also similarly protected. Its immense weight caused an unusually sharp grating sound as it moved upon its hinges. Having deposited a mournful burden upon trestles within this region of horror, we partially turned aside the yet unscrewed lid of the coffin, and looked upon the face of the tenant. A striking similitude between the brother and sister now first arrested my attention, and Usher, divining perhaps my thoughts, murmured out some few words, from which I learned that the deceased and himself had been twins, and that sympathies of a scarcely intelligible nature had always existed between them. Our glances, however, rested not long upon the dead, for we could not regard her unawed. The disease which had thus entombed the lady in the maturity of youth had left, as usual, in all maladies of the strictly cataleptical character, the mockery of a faint blush upon the bosom and the face, and that suspiciously lingering smile upon the lips which is so terrible in death. We replaced and screwed down the lid, and, having secured the door of iron, made our way with toil into the scarcely less gloomy apartments of the upper portion of the house. And now, some days of bitter grief having elapsed, an observable change came over the features of the mental disorder of my friend, his ordinary manner had vanished. His ordinary occupations were neglected or forgotten. He roamed from chamber to chamber with hurried, unequal, and objectless step. The pallor of his countenance had assumed, if possible, a more ghastly hue. But the luminousness of his eye had utterly gone out. The once occasional huskiness of his tone was hurt no more, and a tremulous quaver as if of extreme terror, habitually characterized his utterance. There were times, indeed, 
when I thought his unceasingly agitated mind was labouring with some oppressive secret to divulge which he struggled for the necessary courage. At times, again, I was obliged to resolve all into the mere inexplicable vagaries of madness, for I beheld him gazing upon vacancy for long hours in an attitude of the profoundest attention, as if listening to some imaginary sound. It was no wonder that his condition terrified, that it infected me. I felt creeping upon me, by slow yet certain degrees, the wild influences of his own fantastic yet impressive superstitions. It was especially, upon retiring to bed late in the night, of the seventh or eighth day, after the placing of the Lady Madeline within the dungeon, that I experienced the full power of such feelings. Sleep came not near my couch, while the hours waned and waned away. I struggled to reason off the nervousness which had dominion over me. I endeavoured to believe that much, if not all of what I felt, was due to the bewildering influence of the gloomy furniture of the room, of the dark and tattered draperies which, tortured into motion by the breath of a rising tempest, swayed fitfully to and fro upon the walls, and rustled uneasily about the decorations of the bed. But my efforts were fruitless. An irrepressible tremor gradually pervaded my frame, and at length there sat upon my very heart an incubus of utterly causeless alarm, Shaking this off with a gasp and a struggle, I uplifted myself upon the pillows, and peering earnestly within the intense darkness of the chamber, hearkened, I know not why, except that an instinctive spirit prompted me, to certain low and indefinite sounds which came through the pauses of the storm at long intervals, I know not whence. Overpowered by an intense sentiment of horror, unaccountable yet unendurable i threw on my clothes with haste for i felt that i should sleep no more during the night and endeavoured to arouse myself from the pitiable condition into which i had fallen by pacing rapidly to and fro through the apartment i had taken but few turns in this manner when a light step on an adjoining staircase arrested my attention i presently recognised it as that of usher in an instant afterward he rapped with a gentle touch at my door and entered bearing a lamp his countenance was as usual cadaverously wan but moreover there was a species of mad hilarity in his eyes an evidently restrained hysteria in his whole demeanour his air appalled me but anything was preferable to the solitude which i had so long endured and i even welcomed his presence as a relief and you have not seen it he said abruptly after having stared about him for some moments in silence you have not then seen it but stay you shall thus speaking and having carefully shaded his lamp he hurried to one of the casements and threw it freely open to the storm the impetuous fury of the entering gust nearly lifted us from our feet it was indeed a tempestuous yet sternly beautiful night and one wildly singular in its terror and its beauty. A whirlwind had apparently collected its force in our vicinity, for there were frequent and violent alterations in the direction of the wind, and the exceeding density of the clouds, which hung so low as to press upon the turrets of the house, did not prevent our perceiving the lifelike velocity with which they flew careering from all points against each other without passing away into the distance. I say that even their exceeding density did not prevent our perceiving this, yet we had no glimpse of the moon or stars, nor was there any flashing forth of the lightning, but the under surfaces of the huge masses of agitated vapour, as well as all terrestrial objects immediately around us, were glowing in the unnatural light of a faintly luminous and distinctly visible gaseous exhalation which hung about and enshrouded the mansion you must not you shall not 
behold this said i shudderingly to usher as i led him with a gentle violence from the window to a seat these appearances which bewilder you are merely electrical phenomena not uncommon or it may be that they have their ghastly origin in the rank miasma of the tarn let us close this casement the air is chilling and dangerous to your frame here is one of your favourite romances i will read and you shall listen and so we will pass away this terrible night together the antique volume which i had taken up was the mad twist of sir lancelot canning but i had called it a favourite of usher's more in sad jest than in earnest for in truth there is little in its uncouth and unimaginative prolixity which could have had interest for the lofty and spiritual ideality of my friend it was however the only book immediately at hand and i indulged a vague hope that the excitement which now agitated the hypochondriac might find relief for the history of mental disorder is full of similar anomalies even in the extremeness of the folly which i should read could i have judged indeed by the wild overstrained air of vivacity with which he hearkened or apparently hearkened to the words of the tale i might well have congratulated myself upon the success of my design i had arrived at that well-known portion of the story where ethelred the hero of the tryst having sought in vain for peaceable admission into the dwelling of the hermit proceeds to make good an entrance by force here it will be remembered the words of the narrative run thus and ethelred who was by nature of a doughty heart and who was now mighty with all on account of the powerfulness of the wine which he had drunken awaited no longer to hold parley with the hermit who in sooth was of an obstinate and maliceful turn but feeling the rain upon his shoulders and fearing the rising of the tempest uplifted his mace outright and with blows made quickly room in the plankings of the door for his gauntleted hand and now pulling therewith sturdily he so cracked and ripped and tore all asunder that the noise of the dry and hollow sounding wood alarmed and reverberated throughout the forest at the termination of this sentence i started and for a moment paused for it appeared to me although i at once concluded that my excited fancy had deceived me it appeared to me that from some very remote portion of the mansion there came indistinctly to my ears what might have been in its exact similarity of character the echo but a stifled and dull one certainly of the very cracking and ripping sound which sir launcelot had so particularly described it was beyond doubt the coincidence alone which had arrested my attention for amid the rattling of the sashes of the casements and the ordinary commingled noises of the still increasing storm the sound in itself had nothing surely which should have interested or disturbed me i continued the story but the good champion ethelred now entering within the door was sore enraged and amazed to perceive no signal of the maliceful hermit but in the stead thereof a dragon of a scaly and prodigious demeanour and of a fiery tongue which sat in guard before a palace of gold with a floor of silver and upon the wall there hung a shield of shining brass with this legend enwritten who entereth herein a conqueror hath been who slayeth the dragon the shield he shall win and ethelred uplifted his mace and struck upon the head of the dragon which fell before him and gave up his pusty breath with a shriek so horrid and harsh and with all so piercing that ethelred had feigned to close his ears with his hands against the dreadful noise of it the like whereof 
was never before heard here again i paused abruptly and now with a feeling of wild amazement for there could be no doubt whatever that in this instance i did actually hear although from what direction it proceeded i found it impossible to say a low and apparently distant but harsh protracted and most unusual screaming or grating sound the exact counterpart of what my fancy had already conjured up for the dragon's unnatural shriek as described by the romancer oppressed as i certainly was upon the occurrence of this second and most extraordinary coincidence by a thousand conflicting sensations in which wonder and extreme terror were predominant i still retained sufficient presence of mind to avoid exciting by any observation the sensitive nervousness of my companion i was by no means certain that he had noticed the sounds in question although assuredly a strange alteration had during the last few minutes taken place in his demeanour from a position fronting my own he had gradually brought round his chair so as to sit with his face to the door of the chamber and thus i could but partially perceive his features although i saw that his lips trembled as if he were murmuring inaudibly his head had dropped upon his breast yet i knew that he was not asleep from the wide and rigid opening of the eye as i caught a glance of it in profile the motion of his body too was at variance with this idea for he rocked from side to side with a gentle yet constant and uniform sway having rapidly taken notice of all this i resumed the narrative of sir launcelot which thus proceeded and now the champion having escaped from the terrible fury of the dragon bethinking himself of the brazen shield and of the breaking up of the enchantment which was upon it removed the carcass from out of the way before him and approached valorously over the silver pavement of the castle to where the shield was upon the wall which in sooth tarried not for his full coming but fell down at his feet upon the silver floor with a mighty great and terrible ringing sound no sooner had these syllables passed my lips than as if a shield of brass had indeed at the moment fallen heavily upon a floor of silver i became aware of a distinct hollow metallic and clangorous yet apparently muffled reverberation completely unnerved i leaped to my feet but the measured rocking movement of usher was undisturbed i rushed to the chair in which he sat his eyes were bent fixedly before him and throughout his whole countenance there reigned a stony rigidity but as i placed my hand upon his shoulder there came a strong shudder over his whole person a sickly smile quivered about his lips and i saw that he spoke in a low hurried and gibbering murmur as if unconscious of my presence bending closely over him i at length drank in the hideous import of his words not hear it oh yes i hear it and have heard it long 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 many minutes many hours many days have i heard it yet i dared not hope it in me miserable wretch that i am i dared not i dared not speak we have put her living in the tomb said i not that my senses were acute i now tell you that i heard her first feeble movements in the hollow coffin i heard them many many days ago yet i dared not i dared not speak and now to-night <laughs> the breaking of the hermit's door and the death cry of the dragon and the clangour of the shield <laughs> say rather the rending of her coffin and the grating of the iron hinges of her prison and her struggles within the coppered archway of the vault no oh, whither shall i fly will she not be here anon is she not hurrying to upbraid me for my haste have i not heard her footstep on the stair do i not distinguish that heavy and horrible beating of her heart a oh, madman here he sprang furiously to his feet and shrieked out his syllables as if in the effort he were giving up his soul madman i tell you that she now stands without the door as if in the superhuman energy of his utterance 
there had been found the potency of a spell the huge antique panel to which the speaker pointed threw slowly back upon the instant their ponderous and ebony jaws it was the work of the rushing gust but then without those doors there did stand the lofty and enshrouded figure of the lady madeline of usher there was blood upon her white robes and the evidence of some bitter struggle upon every portion of her emaciated frame for a moment she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold then with a low moaning cry fell heavily inward upon the person of her brother and in her violent and now final death agony bore him to the floor a corpse and a victim to the terrors he had anticipated from that chamber and from that mansion i fled aghast the storm was still abroad in all its wrath as i found myself crossing the old causeway suddenly there shot along the path a wild light and i turned to see whence a gleam so unusual could have issued for the vast house and its shadows were alone behind me the radiance was that of the full setting and blood-red moon which now shone vividly through that once barely discernible fissure of which i have before spoken as extending from the roof of the building in a zigzag direction to the base while i gazed this fissure rapidly widened there came a fierce breath of the whirlwind the entire orb of the satellite burst at once upon my sight my brain reeled as i saw the mighty walls rushing asunder there was a long tumultuous shouting sound like the voice of a thousand waters and the deep and dank tarn at my feet closed sullenly and silently over the fragments of the house of usher End of chapter 8chapter nine of the works of edgar allan poe raven edition volume two by edgar allan poe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony addison silence a fable alkman the mountain pinnacle slumber valleys crags and caves are silent listen to me said the demon as he placed his hand upon my head the region of which i speak is a dreary region in Libya, by the borders of the river Zaire, and there is no quiet there, nor silence. The waters of the river have a saffron and sickly hue and they flow not onwards to the sea but palpitate for ever and for ever beneath the red eye of the sun with a tumultuous and convulsive motion for many miles on either side of the river's oozy bed is a pale desert of gigantic water lilies. They sigh one unto the other in that solitude and stretch towards the heaven their long and ghastly neck and nod to and fro their everlasting heads and there 
is an indistinct murmur which cometh out from among them like the rushing of subterrene water and they sigh one unto the other but there is a boundary to their realm the boundary of the dark horrible lofty forest there like the waves about the hebrides the low underwood is agitated continually but there is no wind throughout the heaven and the tall primeval trees rock eternally hither and thither with a crashing and mighty sound and from their high summits one by one drop everlasting dews and at the roots strange poisonous flowers lie writhing in perturbed slumber and overhead with a rustling and loud noise the grey clouds rush westwardly for ever until they roll a cataract over the fiery wall of the horizon but there is no wind throughout the heaven and by the shores of the river zaire there is neither quiet nor silence it was night and the rain fell and falling it was rain but having fallen it was blood and i stood in the morass among the tall and the rain fell upon my head and the lilies sighed one unto the other in the solemnity of their desolation and all at once the moon arose through the thin ghastly mist and was crimson in colour and mine eyes fell upon a huge grey rock which stood by the shore of the river and was lighted by the light of the moon and the rock was grey and ghastly and tall and the rock was grey upon its front were characters engraven in the stone and i walked through the morass of water lilies until i came close unto the shore that i might read the characters upon the stone but i could not decipher them and i was going back into the morass when the moon shone with a fuller red and I turned and looked again upon the rock, and upon the characters, and the characters were desolation. And I looked upwards, and there stood a man upon the summit of the rock, and I hid myself among the water-lilies, that I might discover the actions of the man and the man was tall and stately in form, and was wrapped up from his shoulders to his feet in the toga of old Rome, and the outlines of his figure were indistinct, but his features were the features of a deity, for the mantle of the night and of the mist and of the moon and of the dew had left uncovered the features of his face and his brow was lofty with thought and his eye wild with care and in the few furrows upon his cheek i read the fables of sorrow and weariness and disgust with mankind and a longing after solitude 
and the man sat upon the rock, and leaned his head upon his hand, and looked out upon the desolation. He looked down into the low, unquiet shrubbery, and up into the tall, primeval trees, and up higher at the rustling heaven, and into the crimson moon. And I lay close within shelter of the lilies, and observed the actions of the man, and the man trembled in the solitude, but the night waned, and he sat upon the rock. And the man turned his attention from the heaven, and looked out upon the dreary river Zaire, and upon the yellow ghastly waters, and upon the pale legions of the water-lilies. And the man listened to the sighs of the water-lilies, and to the murmur that came up from among them. And I lay close within my covert, and observed the actions of the man. And the man trembled in the solitude. But the night waned, and he sat upon the rock. Then I went down into the recesses of the morass, and waded afar in among the wilderness of the lilies, and called unto the hippopotami, which dwelt among the fens in the recesses of the morass. And the hippopotami heard my call, and came with the behemoth unto the foot of the rock, and roared loudly and fearfully beneath the moon. And I lay close within my covert, and observed the actions of the man. And the man trembled in the solitude, but the night waned, and he sat upon the rock. Then I cursed the elements with the curse of tumult, and a frightful tempest gathered in the heaven where before there had been no wind, and the heaven became livid with the violence of the tempest, and the rain beat upon the head of the man, and the floods of the river came down, and the river was tormented into foam, and the water lilies shrieked within their beds, and the forest crumbled before the wind, and the thunder rolled, and the lightning fell, and the rock rocked to its foundation. And I lay close within my covert, and observed the actions of the man. And the man trembled in the solitude, but the night waned, and he sat upon the rock. Then I grew angry and cursed with the curse of silence, the river and the lilies and the wind and the forest and the heaven and the thunder, and the sighs of the water-lilies. And they became accursed, and were still, and the moon ceased to totter up its pathway to heaven, and the thunder died away, and the lightning did not flash, and the clouds hung motionless, and the waters sunk to their level and remained, and the trees ceased to rock, and the water-lilies sighed no more, and the murmur was heard no longer from among them, nor any shadow of sound throughout the vast, illimitable desert. And I looked 
upon the characters of the rock, and they were changed, and the characters were silence. And mine eyes fell upon the countenance of the man, and his countenance was one with terror, and hurriedly he raised his head from his hand, and stood forth upon the rock and listened. But there was no voice throughout the vast, illimitable desert, and the characters upon the rock were silent. And the man shuddered, and turned his face away, and fled afar off in haste, so that I beheld him no more. Now there are fine tales in the volumes of the Magi, in the iron-bound, melancholy volumes of the Magi. Therein, I say, are glorious histories of the heaven, and of the earth, and of the mighty sea, and of the genii that overruled the sea, and the earth, and the lofty heaven. There was much law, too, in the sayings that were said by the sibyls, and holy, holy things were heard of old by the dim leaves that trembled around Dodona. But, as Allah liveth, that fable which the demon told me as he sat by my side in the shadow of the tomb, I hold to be the most wonderful of all. And as the demon made an end of his story, he fell back within the cavity of the tomb and laughed. And I could not laugh with the demon. And he cursed me because I could not laugh. And the link which dwelleth for ever in the tomb, came out therefrom, and lay down at the feet of the demon, and looked at him steadily in the face. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe Raven Edition, Volume 2, by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Mask of the Red Death The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal, the redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness, and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body, and especially upon the face of the victim, were the pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. And the whole seizure progress and termination of the disease were the incidents of half an hour but the prince prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious when his dominions were half depopulated he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court and with these retired to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in. This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the bolts they resolved to leave means neither of ingress or egress 
to the sudden impulses of despair or a frenzy from within the abbey was amply provisioned with such precautions the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion the external world could take care of itself in the meantime it was folly to grieve or to think the prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure there were buffoons there were improvisatori there were ballet dancers there were musicians there was beauty there was wine all these and security were within without was the red death it was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad that the prince prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence it was a voluptuous scene that masquerade uh, but first let me tell you of the rooms in which it was held there were seven an imperial suite in many palaces however such suites form a long and straight vista while the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand so that the view of the whole extent is scarcely impeded here the case was very different as might have been expected from the duke's love of the bizarre the apartments were so irregularly disposed that the vision embraced but little more than one at a time there was a sharp turn at every twenty or thirty yards and at each turn a novel effect to the right and left in the middle of each wall a tall and narrow gothic window looked out upon a closed corridor which pursued the windings of the suite these windows were of stained glass whose colour varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened that at the eastern extremity was hung for example in blue and vividly blue were its windows the second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries and here the panes were purple the third was green throughout and so were the casements the fourth was furnished and lighted with orange the fifth with white, the sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only, the colour of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The panes here were scarlet, a deep blood colour, now in no one of the seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum amid the profusion of golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro or depended from the roof there was no light of any kind emanating from lamp or candle within the suite of chambers but in the corridors that followed the suite there stood opposite to each window a heavy tripod bearing a brazier of fire that projected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illumined the room and thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances but in the western or black chamber the effect of the firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood dented panes was ghastly in the extreme and produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. It was in this apartment also that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony. Its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang, and when the minute hand made the circuit of the face and the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock 
a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at each lapse of an hour the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance to hearken to the sound and thus the waltzers perforce seized their evolutions and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company and while the chimes of the clock yet rang it was observed that the giddiest grew pale and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows as if in confused reverie or meditation but when the echoes had fully ceased a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly the musicians looked at each other and smiled as if at their own nervousness and folly and made whispering vows each to the other that the next chiming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion and then after the lapse of sixty minutes which embrace three thousand and six hundred seconds of the time that flies there came yet another chiming of the clock and then with the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before but in spite of these things it was a gay and magnificent revel the tastes of the duke were peculiar he had a fine eye for colours and effects he disregarded the decora of mere fashion his plans were bold and fiery and his conceptions glowed with barbaric lustre there are some who would have thought him mad his followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he was not. He had directed in great part the movable embellishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of this great fate, and it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. There were much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm much of what has been seen since in hanani there were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments there were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions there was much of the beautiful much of the wanton much of the bizarre something of the terrible and not a little of that which might have excited disgust to and fro in the seven chambers there stalked in fact a multitude of dreams and these the dreams writhed in and about taking hue from the rooms and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps and anon there strikes the ebony clock which stands in the hall of the velvet and then for a moment all is still and all is silent save the voice of the clock the dreams are stiff frozen as they stand but the echoes of the chime die away they have endured but an instant and a light half subdued laughter floats after them as they depart and now again the music swells and the dreams live and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever taking hue from the many tinted windows through which stream the rays from the tripods but to the chamber which lies most westwardly of the seven there are now none of the maskers who venture for the night is waning away and there flows a ruddier light through the blood-coloured panes and the blackness of the sable drapery appalls and to him whose foot falls upon the sable carpet there comes from the near clock of ebony a muffled peal more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches their ears who indulge in the more remote gaieties of the other apartments but these other apartments were densely crowded and in them beat feverishly the heart of life and the revel went whirling the arm until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock 
and then the music ceased as i have told and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted and there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before but now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock and thus it happened perhaps that more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who revelled and thus too it happened perhaps that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before and the rumour of this new presence having spread itself whisperingly around there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or murmur expressive of disapprobation and surprise then finally of terror of horror and of disgust in an assembly of phantasms such as i have painted it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such sensation in truth the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited but the figure in question had out herded herod and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum there are chords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion even with the utterly lost doom life and death are equally jests there are matters of which no jest can be made the whole company indeed seemed now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger neither wit nor propriety existed the figure was tall and gaunt and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave the mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat and yet all this might have been endured if not approved by the mad revellers around but the mummer had gone so far as to assume the type of the red death his vesture was dabbled in blood and his broad brow with all the features of the face was besprinkled with the scarlet horror when the eyes of prince prospero fell upon this spectral image which with a slow and solemn movement as if more fully to sustain its role stalked to and fro among the waltzers he was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder either of terror or distaste but in the next his brow reddened with rage. Who dares? He demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him. Who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room where stood the prince, with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who, at the moment, was also near at hand, and now, with deliberate and stately steps, made closer approach to the speaker but from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired the whole party there were found none who put forth hand to seize him so that unimpeded he passed within a yard of the prince's person and while the vast assembly as if with one impulse shrank from the centres of the rooms to the walls he made his way uninterruptedly but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first through the blue chamber to the purple through the purple to the green through the green to the orange through this again to the white and even thence to the violet ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him it was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage, 
and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger, and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure, when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which instantly afterwards fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revellers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and corpse-like mask which they handled with so violent a rudeness, untenanted by any tangible form. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revellers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay, and the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay, and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. End of chapter 10《Of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 2, by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Cast of Amontillado The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as I best could but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length I would be avenged. This was a point definitively settled, but the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my good will. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit, or for the most part their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity to practice imposture upon the British and Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmary, a Fortunato, like his countryman, was a quack. But in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skilful in the Italian vintages myself, 
and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk, one evening, during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, My dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you are looking today. But I have received a pipe of what passes for Amontillado, and I have my doubts. How, said he, Amontillado, a pipe impossible, and in the middle of the carnival. I have my doubts, I replied, and I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado! I have my doubts. Amontillado! And I must satisfy them. Amontillado! As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchese. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me. Lucchese! Cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry! And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. With us? To your vaults. My friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement, Lucchese. I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no, it is not the engagement but the severe cold with which i perceive you are afflicted the vaults are insufferably damp they are encrusted with nitre let us go nevertheless the cold is merely nothing amontillado you have been imposed upon and as for lucchese he cannot distinguish sherry from amontillado <laughs> thus speaking a fortunato possessed himself of my arm putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a roquelaire closely about my person i suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo there were no attendants at home they had absconded to make merry in honour of the time i had told them that i should not return until the morning and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces two flambeaux, and giving one to Fortunato, bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vault. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent, and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe! said he it is farther on said i oh but observe the wet webwork which gleams from these cavern walls he turned towards me and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication nitre he asked at length nitre i replied how long have you had that cough 
<coughs> My poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It is nothing, he said at last. Come, I said, with decision, we will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy as once I was. You are a man to be missed. For me it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucasi. Enough, he said. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True, true, I replied. And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should use all proper caution. A draught of this medoc will defend us from the damps. Here I knocked off the neck of a bottle which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mould. Drink, I said presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly, while his bells jingled. I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us. And I to your long life. He again took my arm, and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive. The Montresors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. A huge human foot, a door, in a field azure, the foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel and the motto nemo me impune lacessit good he said the wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled my own fancy grew warm with the medoc we had passed through walls of piled bones, with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The nitre, I said, see, it increases, it hangs like moss upon the vaults, we are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back ere it is too late. Your cough, it is nothing, he said. Let us go on, but first another draught of the medoc. I broke and reached him a flagon of de Grave. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upward with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the masons yes yes i said yes yes you impossible a mason 
A mason, I replied. A sign, he said. It is this, I answered, producing a trowel from beneath the fold of my roquelaire. You jest, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces, but let us proceed to the Amontillado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak, and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at the deep crypt, in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead, in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior recess, in depth about four feet, in width three, in height, six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no especial use in itself, but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs, and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavoured to pry into the depths of the recess. Its termination the feeble light did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said, herein is the Amontillado. As for Lucchese, he is an ignoramus, interrupted my friend, as he stepped unsteadily forward, while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant he had reached the extremity of the niche, and, finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more, and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more let me implore you to return. No, then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado! ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied, the Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials, and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. 
I had scarcely laid the first tier of my masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depth of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which, that I might hearken to it with the more satisfaction, I ceased my labours and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused, and, holding the flambeau over the mason-work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams, bursting suddenly from the throat of the chained form, seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment I hesitated, I trembled, Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamoured. I re-echoed, I aided, I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this, and the clamourer grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> A very good joke indeed, an excellent jest. We will have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo. <laughs> Over our wine. <laughs> The Amontillado, I said. <laughs> yes, the Amontillado. But is it not getting late? Will not they be awaiting us at the Palazzo, the Lady Fortunato, and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said, let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresa. Yes, I said, for the love of God. But to these words I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud, Fortunato! No answer. I called again, Fortunato! No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick. On account of the dampness of the catacombs, I hastened to make an end of my labour. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requiescat! End of chapter 11